Muy buenas tardes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure for me um, at the University of Antioquia um, to be here again with you, sharing a little bit what we are doing and what we are investigating and with whom we are cooperating, trying to serve to the community. In this opportunity, we have a special guest, Dr. Randy True, CEO of Flood Lamp a, uh, Biotechnologies, a public corporation um, created in August 2020 with the aim of providing answering, answers and solutions to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. True has a Bachelor of Physics and a Master in Electrical Engineering, both from Stanford University. He is a holder of at least 10 patents, mainly related to the development of microparticles and microbarcodes. Mr. True has been awarded with several research grants and in his most outstanding work experience, uh, we can highlight that he has been founder or, and CEO of the company Two Materials, vice president of Liquid Array Affymetrics Inc and consultant and advisor uh, to the CEO of Shaper Tools Inc. He currently serves, serves uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, advisor and consultant at Angel Investors. The reason uh, why we are cooperating is to move ahead with our initiative to develop and provide to the community a COVID-19 diagnostic test at low cost as it is or has been the philosophy of the Protocolo Colombia uh, here at the University of Antioquia. Uh, today, Mr. True will tell us uh, about his progresses with flood lamp and uh, this loop mediated isothermal ampl amplification essay uh, he will show us. Uh, so Mr. True, welcome to this academic event. Uh, you have about 30 minutes for your talk and then we will move ahead with a question section uh, from the attendees. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Professor Gamez. Uh, los, lo siento, uh, mi español es muy malo. Uh, tenía clases in, in Medellín, pero uh, I, uh, seis años uh, a pasa. So uh, I will talk in English um, and try to talk uh, clearly so um, everyone can understand. Um, I, uh, I have a strong love for, for your city and country and was fortunate enough to have a, a friend from, from Antioquia, from, uh, from near Retiro, who I've stayed with many times, including for three months um, in 2014, where I met Professor Isabel Hanau, um, who I connected with a few weeks ago uh, once I learned about how uh, severe the crisis was continuing to be in Colombia. So I don't want to give you uh, a, 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 any long personal background, um, except that I was also working in um, in science education when the when the crisis hit. That's that's what I've been doing for the last several years, um, and uh, I was actually teaching at a high school. Um, and because of my background in in biotechnology, I thought that we were going to to bring up testing in the United States to end the crisis quickly. And then I saw that we had lots of problems with, with molecular diagnostics and testing in the industry and in the regulatory environment, and that, that there were lots of, essentially lots of problems. So I first started working on testing through my education nonprofit, um, uh, but saw more opportunity to build an organization uh, as a public benefit corporation. And so I formed this, this, uh, this company um, which is like half half startup and half nonprofit. That's a way you can think about it. We have built into the company's charter a commitment to uh, open protocols and, and infectious disease screening for the public good. So we're trying to chart a, a, new, a new path in a space that's normally very proprietary and, and closed. Um, so, and it's with that uh, mission and, and ethos that we that we have um, pursued developing the types of tests that, we, that we've been working on. Um, so let me jump into that and get started. Uh, uh, did that work? Oh, sorry, hang on one sec. So 
sorry, I'm having problems with my computer. There we go. All right. Can you see uh, my title slide? Yes, we can see them. Great. I, I unfortunately was not able to translate the whole thing into Spanish, uh, but we will um, try to do a, a translated version of, of this for folks. Um, so the, the title of the talk is uh, Scalable and Accessible Molecular Testing, both for COVID-19 and, and beyond. And I'm going to present to you the, the direct PCR and instrument-free LAMP tests that we've developed and validated. Uh, and we're in the, the, the process of collaborating with Gustavo to try to uh, share this work with, with your country and, and others. Uh, sorry. So th the motivation for a lot of this work is that molecular tests are cost too much and are too difficult or inaccessible. And that has led to them not being used um, in the to their full potential in the COVID crisis. And if they were, it could save lots of lives. And the the progress made during COVID can can extend to using new types of of cheaper, more accessible tests to improve health more broadly. Um, so our our primary uh, solution that we've developed is a massively scalable screening program. And the, the short overview of the program itself involves collecting samples. And typically we're collecting small pools of, a, of about four to five samples, which can be uh, families. This, the test works with just a single sample as well, which might be the preference in, in, a, in a country or a region with, with high prevalence and an and a ongoing outbreak. Um, but pooling allows for efficient uh, screening in a, in a program and can also be used very effectively even in, in high prevalence areas if it's uh, organized in a certain way. So um, the samples are returned. And we're, we're working on many aspects of a whole program to reduce the friction. And a key part of that is to get quick results because you need to get quick results in order to break the chains of transmission and, and let people know that they're positive. So the, the way that we do, uh, that we achieve these um, components of the program is through uh, the structure of creating distributed lab sites. And I, I'm actually uh, calling uh, and into the Zoom from a lab that we have popped up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida at, a, at an emergency medicine conference. I flew in on Sunday night with two bags and my partners had set up the tables in this room. And we have a, a pop-up COVID testing lab here that we can do uh, hundreds or even up to 500 plus pooled samples uh, in a session. Um, and this is, this is a, an example of how, of how the new, this new generation of tests uh, can be used. We've primarily developed our programs to work from, from labs, um, but the, the, the proposal that, that we're working on for Columbia and, and suggesting is to use a combination of, of formal structured labs with distributed sites that don't need as much infrastructure and can have lower cost. And some, some aspects of the tests facilitate that. So uh, one key aspect of that, the tests that enable that is that they are much easier than purified assays. And so the two assays that we focused on are direct. And so they work from uh, without the extraction um, step that's typical of molecular tests. The, the SARS virus is actually very easy to lyse and the RNA is very accessible once, once you lyse a sample. So it's very amenable to uh, direct extractionless protocols. That minimizes the hands-on time, lowers the cost and, and makes the tests much more efficient. Um, and what we've, I, I mean, I should mention that, you know, overall we, 
we believe in a portfolio approach to testing. There's not a one size fits all test. Um, there are important places for very high sensitivity purified PCR tests. Uh, and there is, there is a role for even lower sensitivity um, antigen tests. But the, what we've targeted and focused around is a, a high sensitivity molecular test that can be massively scaled and we think is the best solution for large scale testing and screening. Uh, so the, the, the flagship tests that, that, that we've developed, um, and when I say we've developed, I, I even feel uh, somewhat uncomfortable saying that sometimes because what we are using is, is a, a protocol adapted from a paper. And I, I apologize, I should have a reference to the paper here. Um, it's a group out of Harvard. It's Professor Connie Sefko and a, and a graduate student, Brian Rabe, who have been uh, collaborators with us from the beginning of this work uh, and been generous with both their time, materials, and expertise. And they, they've developed one of, the, uh, one of the premier protocols in the space that's been adapted into various formats. Um, and their, their, their tests consist of using uh, RT LAMP. Um, and if you're not familiar with LAMP, it's another amplification technology that has, has been around and it's, it's my understanding that the primary patents are finally coming or coming off patent this at the end of this year. Um, but it's really come to its own in COVID and, and the primer development has, has grown and the, the use of the test has, has dramatically increased. And it, it, it generates uh, much more DNA than PCR in a smaller amount of time. And a key aspect is that it's isothermal. And so it could run on a simple heat block and doesn't need the thermal cycling. And since it generates so much DNA, uh, a, a, uh, a variety of different uh, additions can be added, such as a phenol red dye or other dyes um, to generate a visual color change in the solution. So I, I sometimes tell people, you know, imagine if testing for COVID was so easy that, that you could just add a sample to a chemical and, what, and see if the tube changes color. And that's really what, what LAMP allows. And this, this um, particular formulation is by uh, New England Biolabs. And they've been a uh, tremendous um, uh, facilitator of, of LAMP in the, in the uh, community in, in the US and, and globally. And so we, uh, so far, we have uh, uh, focused on development around this, this particular master mix uh, product. Okay, um, the, the two, so, so jumping into really the meat of what I want to share with you is the two tests that we've come to. We've, we've been developing and working on uh, LAMP and these tests for over a year now. And about six months ago, we stabilized to these, these, two, uh, these two tests. I mean, actually, actually I should mention that we've, we've fully validated a third test that uses fluorometric LAMP run on a PCR machine as well. That test does uh, give you results in, in a third the amount of time of a standard PCR run. Um, but we think the combination of these two tests, the colometric lamp test, which doesn't need the PCR machine, and PCR run from the same sample provide a, a great combination. Um, uh, so that's the, I, I should mention here, um, the highlights of the tests are that uh, in our clinical evaluation, we saw a, a, about a 90% sensitivity with the, uh, with the LAMP test and a 98% sensitivity with the PCR test. Now, I feel like I should always give the caveat that this sensitivity number is highly dependent on the sample set chosen. It's, it's not a, a, an objective measurement. The objective measurement of performance of the test is, is the limit of detection. And uh, I believe on another slide, I should have the, the limit of detection. The limit of detection we measured for the LAMP test was uh, 12,500 copies per milliliter. And for the PCR, it was 3,000. So here, yeah, okay. Uh, I apologize, these are flipped. Uh, the LAMP is on the bottom now, so I hope that's not uh, too confusing, but 
Um, this is the data from uh, our evaluation work for our FDA emergency use authorization submission. We have submitted these tests to the US FDA. Uh, we have not received a review yet. Um, and, and I must give the disclaimer that they are in no way um, authorized uh, or approved yet. Um, but we are hoping to, to, to get them approved and, and uh, quickly proceed to uh, disseminating them, them further. The clinical evaluation was done by the Stanford CLIA lab, um, and we were very grateful for them in taking the time and, and uh, samples to, to do this work for us. Um, they actually did it in less than one day and commented that the protocols were very straightforward to run. And they've done a lot of evaluations for other tests, that, many of which take several days of training. Um, so we, we were pretty happy with the way the results turned out and the the feedback from, from the technician and lab director that, that were uh, doing the work. Here is an actual picture of the sample plate. And you'll see all the bright pink samples are the negatives and the bright yellow samples are all the positives. There are a couple of, of orange, orangish samples and those are the weaker, uh, higher CT uh, positive samples. But we, we, uh, we didn't get any false positives in, in the test, which was um, a, a very good result. So I, I do want to highlight that um, in addition to these tests, we've been developing all the wraparound components that are needed to implement uh, a, a mass screening program at scale. And the other key part of that besides the test chemistry is the uh, digital side. And so we've developed a, a mobile app um, for both the collection of pooled samples um, and for the processing of them by a lab. Essentially, the lab side works as a very streamlined um, uh, limb system that can control the flow of the samples through the lab. And, and the app facilitates the reporting of results directly via uh, email and text message and, and through the app itself. Um, we just got notification that the app was approved for the Google Play Store and it's on the, uh, on the iOS. And so um, at some point, Gustavo, I can, I can give you a demo, though I think the majority of our work for in the near term is gonna be focused on the tests themselves and the, and the, the test chemistry and validating that. It, yeah, a quick overview, I think if, if uh, You've been working on testing and in the space, you sort of understand some of the trade-offs between the different types of tests. Um, this, I'm sorry, this this test is very or this slide is very uh, U.S. focused in terms of some of the companies um, mentioned, and this is also focused around uh, our uh, our uh, school screening in the United States, which is has been of great interest. Um, so the the upshot is that that the the direct uh, LAMP and PCR tests that we've developed have, have high sensitivity, not quite as high as purified PCR, but provide much faster time to results, um, both because of the direct assay itself and because, especially for the LAMP test, the fact that you can have uh, more basic labs or even what we call processing sites that can be closer uh, to the communities that are being screened. And being able to get same day results when you're when you're screening for new uh, un, you know new unknown uh, infections is 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 critical. Um, if if uh, you, again sort of if you've been following the, the the sort of new learnings in science about the 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 viral load and and limits of detections of various tests this this uh, has been. You know, important development over the last year, and and championed by uh, Professor Mike, Michael Minna of Harvard, as well as many others. And you know, we've we've learned a couple of really important things about testing for the virus. You know, it it spikes to a very high level quickly, and in usually in in the phase where people are uh, pre symptomatic, if they even develop symptoms, um, and then on the on the tail end of infection drops uh, more slowly. Um, but what this highlights is the need to 
in order to catch new infections to test more frequently. Um, but the highest sensitivity test is, isn't required at all and is, is, is uh, overkill. And it's more than overkill. It's, it, if, it, if it takes more than one to two days to get the results, it's, it, it, it vastly loses its, its utility. And so it becomes far worse than a medium or low sensitivity test because you don't find out the results for until the person could have already caused spread. Uh, so this really points the way to the, the sort of solution that we've developed with it, which is a, a sensitive, a, a medium sensitivity test that can massively scale. So here's um, how we have uh, spec'd out. Oh, I apologize. There's a little uh, mismatch here on this slide. It's a little bit messy. This is overlaid on top of a, a, uh, a plot from uh, one of the groups that has, has developed saliva-based lamp tests really uh, extensively. And that's a group from Colorado uh, with Professor Sarah Sawyer. Um, here's where sort of these limits of detection fit in. And this isn't a perfect match for us because we use um, we use uh, swabs, na AN nasal swabs, and these uh, viral loads are for saliva. But roughly, this is this shows that the the good antigen tests um, are below the threshold of of uh, contagiousness, uh, where live virus is culturable. Um, and at the uh, at the other far end of the spectrum, you have the the most sensitive purified tests, such as in the United, in the United States. These are the, the two main uh, two main tests that um, have among the highest sensitivity are TAC path and Perkin Elmer. So this is this is sort of breakdown of of how some various tests fit in in terms of their LODs. But all of these are uh, usually uh, below the, the the contagious threshold. Okay, um, I I want to to jump into. Uh, describing a little bit about what what we're planning and what we're hoping to to work with uh, Columbia on what essentially what we are are uh, planning to do is is uh, share our our results our kits our materials um, in order to quickly validate the test in a in phase one of a project and we Working with these two tests in, in tandem during the validation phase is, is a really helpful step because you can characterize uh, samples with the PCR and then run, run uh, confirmation and run um, limits of detection uh, series with, with, the, uh, with the lamp reaction. Um, so a phase two of the project that we're envisioning is to uh, transfer the processing to sites outside of the university. And this is really where the power of this test comes in because you don't need the PCR machines. You just need heat blocks or even uh, basic uh, water baths that can be run, the, the reactions can be run in plates in a water bath. It enables um, a modality where in, in, a, in a centralized lab, reaction plates can be made and then shared with uh, with other sites as as in as a, in ready to run format, so that they can be they can make the processing in those other sites even even more streamlined. Uh, so a simple a simple single uh, pipette step from from an inactivated sample into the reaction plate uh, could be done in you know essentially in in a room like this. Um, so the components that that we're uh, prepared and, and planning to, to, to share with Columbia as a part of this project are our full EUA submissions uh, for both the PCR and the LAMP tests. And again, we're waiting review on those. And those contain the uh, in silico inclusivity and cross-reactivity analysis, uh, as well as variant analysis. Um, we, we may need to update that soon, um, given the increase in the number and scope of variants, but the lamp test especially is is quite robust to uh, to uh, mismatches in in the targets and, and variation. And, and recently, uh, the the Global Lamp Consortium discussed the uh, whether the main primer sets were were uh, in in danger of uh, of being compromised from variants, and the, the 
the, the consensus among the community is that the, the tests are all, and the main primer sets, including ours, are all still working quite well. And there's some bioinformaticians that uh, monitor the, the variants and, the, and have tools to assess the, the performance of, of the primer sets. So we don't see any, any red flags yet, but that is something to continue to, to pay attention to. The second thing that we can share are the validation guide and kits. Um, so we've done pilot production of the components for the tests and, and uh, formatted those into a, a kit that we can ship down and share that will help, uh, help get the ball rolling. Um, a third thing we can share is an IRB for a clinical study, you know, that depending on your regulatory environment that may be needed, it, it, it may not, but uh, we have that and are, are happy to share it. Um, probably one of the biggest uh, components is that we have uh, large numbers of, uh, of diagnostic grade production primers, which are HPLC, HPLC purified and which we've uh, validated that we can share as a part of this to help, to help, to help this move, move quickly. Um, we're in the process of seeking uh, additional partners for support in this in this work, and it's you know we see it as a as a as an urgent mission to to help uh, help your country. Uh, here, here's you know just sort of a quick overview of of the the EUA documentation, um, and depending on the similarity and overlap with what's required. Um, again, a lot of the in silico analysis may, may help uh, expedite uh, validation and, and regulatory approval. So again, we're happy to share that. And we've, I should mention that we, that we have um, offered uh, uh, what's called a right of reference to, to the, the validation of these primers if our EUA gets, gets uh, approved. So that would be very helpful in the United States as well. Um, a quick overview, and we could refer to this if if the if there are questions about um, the tests and sort of how they fit into the overall landscape of tests. We've done a lot of uh, analysis of the landscape of tests um, because, again, what we've been trying to do is choose the right combination of components of the tests. It would be good performance, supply chain robust, would be highly scalable and able to be distributed and run in, uh, in low resource settings. Here's a, a reformatting of that information into kind of a, a diagram of flow from a sample. Um, and I do include on here a test called Saliva Direct, which was developed by uh, researchers at Yale, including a close a collaborator and uh, and mentor of of, of mine, uh, Ann Wiley. Um, she's done fantastic work in this space and continues to be a a, a real driver and an inspiration for for many of us working. We're lucky to um, to uh, have her as a as an advisor for the company. Um, the saliva direct uses a protonase K inactivation, and our tests use a I, and again, I, I shouldn't, I don't even feel, you know, comfortable saying our tests, you know, the tests that, that we're trying to spread uh, use a TCEP EDTA uh, inactivation. Um, and this is a, a shelf stable chemical. Um, we are using the same exact uh, primers as saliva direct for the PCR test. We're just coming from a swab uh, sample instead of a saliva sample. Um, and interestingly, the the best, as far as I, I know, the best protocols for LAMP on saliva use a combination of TCEP and Pro-K. So the, the LAMP test uh, has, a, again, a, a visual readout. If you want the more complicated version, uh, including some of the open source protocols for purification, we worked on, the, on a glass milk purification. We're just starting to work on MAC bead before we before we settled on using the direct assay instead. So I could, I could give you my perspective on, on those um, and, and the sort of uh, uh, broader field as well. Um, there are various versions of the LAMP tests that we use, including one I learned about uh, recently um, that uses a swab direct, dipped directly in a, in a reaction mix. There are others that use a one pot 
what, what I call a one pot reaction that takes a, a sample straight, a, an eluded uh, uh, swab sample in UTM straight into a master mix. So there's a lot of variations of this. We think the two-step uh, chemical and heat inactivation plus lamp or PCR is a, is a, is a winner in terms of uh, usability and performance. So again, another breakdown of the same kind of information. Um, when we can come back to this, if there's questions and, and use, you know, use these to help help uh, help in understanding. Uh, I want to highlight um, the people who have, have been involved in, and helped uh, make all this work happen, um, especially my my partner in this, uh, Kevin Schaller. He's he like me uh, uh, is has been a successful entrepreneur and. And when the COVID crisis hit, felt compelled to, um, to, to, to put his brain and resources to work in, 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 uh, in relief efforts. And he founded a 10,000 plus person uh, volunteer scientist database. Uh, we have one volunteer who we trained today on running the tests. Uh, she actually ran uh, real, sam real pooled samples from the conference participants and, uh, and, and ran it and had it work fine, uh, fine the first time. So um, Kevin is our, our, our chief, science, uh, chief operations officer and Teresa Ling has, has uh, spearheaded all of the digital uh, design. We have great advisors, uh, both on the scientific and industry side, and then some key collaborators in the uh, GLAMP consortium and uh, uh, Jeff Huber and Cliff Wang from Open COVID Screen. So thank you very much, um, Gustavo and, and Lilu and Isabel for uh, really, really jumping into this and, and, and helping to, uh, to make these connections. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to, um, to this work. Okay, uh, thank you very much, everyone. I'm happy to, to pause here and, uh, and take questions. And I hope I didn't talk too fast. <laughs> was really okay, Randy. Thank you so much for this uh, clear and, and nice talk. Also for, for the contributions you can, you can do to our country uh, by means of the Protocolo Colombia, uh, the initiative we are working at the University of Antioquia. So maybe in the near future, we will have uh, great news for the community. Hopefully the material can arrive uh, as soon as possible to check and, and to perform all the experiments necessary for the validation. So um, the, the, the section for question is now open. If somebody uh, wants to ask uh, something, can open the, the microphone and, and go ahead. Good afternoon. Can I ask in Spanish? Yes. Sí, sí, Gustavo can translate if, uh, which I likely need. Gracias. Mi inglés no, no es tan bueno. Disculpe. Tengo entendido que las LAM colorimétricas pues aprovechan el descenso en el pH para cambiar el color. En, de, tengo un video que entonces es el, uno de los sistemas que usted nos está anunciando, pero ¿cómo controlan ustedes que en los sistemas van pot eh, que sustancias que pueda traer la propia muestra no la fluidifiquen suficiente para que haya viraje del color incluso antes de la amplificación? Um, Randy, Johan is asking about the colorimetric method, how how to control in the, because this is based on the pH. How is in your system control all the problems uh, this colorimetric detection could have? So that, that's, that's a really good question. Um, the, the sensitivity of, of the reaction to the incoming pH of the sample has been, been a real problem with saliva. And we actually started with saliva um, and experienced that sort of firsthand. Um, I do think some groups have uh, made a lot of progress and perhaps solved that even with the phenol, the phenol red dye. Other groups have moved to different dyes that aren't pH dependent. So one of the leading lamp groups is out of Vienna 
And if you haven't seen uh, the website, rtlamp.org, I, I highly encourage it. They've done uh, fantastic work and they use a dye called hydroxynaphthalene blue. Um, and I'm not familiar with the, how the chemistry works, except that, that it's apparently magnesium dependent. Um, and the, the color change is less, is less obvious by the, by the, by the unaided eye, but it actually, if you, you can put it through a simple filter from a cell phone picture and it becomes, becomes quite clear. I'm interested in trying that dye in the long term, but there aren't commercial uh, master mixes with that dye available now. And we also, um, we also wanted to switch to nasal swabs because the, the, there was, has become less of a problem with the supply chain of nasal swabs. And the, we found higher sensitivity with nasal swabs because the matrix that you elute them in, and we, we started with PBS and now have moved to saline, just straight 0.9% saline, is a more consistent matrix. And so I think because of that, I think we get higher sensitivity. And then a second reason, uh, and probably the most important reason is for pooling, um, because you can um, collect swabs together and actually I should have one here because this is what this is what we're doing right outside uh, this 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 uh, office here out out in a in a curtain room we're collecting uh, pooled sw dry swabs and then we elute them right here so we we've um, uh, been been you know acutely aware of and interested in uh, essentially the problem with false positives from, from RT lamp. Uh, and that's another one, one thing we did with the protocol was shorten the incubation time from 30 minutes to 25 minutes, which gives you a little bit of a sensitivity hit, but reduces your chance of having any false positives. Now I should, I should mention that, um, I, I heard recently that, uh, that a, uh, Italian, um, genomics Institute, IGCEP has developed or has had good success with a uh, the same inactivation solution we're using with um, with the phenol red NEB colometric lamp mix. And actually, I heard on on a, uh, another report, a, a university in the US, what they do when they get uh, spurious um, reactions that turn orange that's what happens with with some of the saliva samples they take those samples and they rerun them with adding more sodium hydroxide to to uh to increase the ph of the starting sample so there's some some tricks and some improvements that have happened to help deal with the, the ph problems with saliva and we're interested in adopting those and and helping to um to develop that test as well, but we had to make a decision in terms of what to go with and to to push and and do our do our main program around and validate with the FDA. And we chose uh, pooled swabs um, for these reasons. Thank you, Doctor Randy. And New England BioLabs is one of the best country, best of, of the best companies in the world. Uh, providing reagents for uh, these isothermal amplifications, these lamps, and your 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 company is also working tightly with them, right? I, I yes, we don't we don't have a formal relationship with them yet. They they have um, their scientists and their and their business people have been uh, fantastic in the lamp community. Uh, Dr. Nathan Tanner uh, published. The, the, in collaboration uh, with, I don't, I apologize, don't recall the other uh, folks on that paper. Some of the, er, the the earliest, essentially RT lab COVID paper back in February, and he's been on a, a weekly call with our global lab consortium for over a year, and has made himself accessible for all kinds of troubleshooting, and has has just been a, a tremendous uh, facilitator and and uh, tremendous scientist in in the space. Um, and New England Biolabs recently became a, formerly became a, a benefit company as well. Um, and they, they are known to be in one of the most respected uh, biologics and reagent companies in the, in the entire space, so. 
Randy, we have here um, a comment from Viviana Martinez. Uh, mm -hmm. She says, congratulations. This is definitely a technique that uh, reduces the cost and obviously the accessibility of the uh, COVID testing, uh, especially in remote areas. Mm -hmm. um, she wants she want also to ask about something very, very fundamental in the lamp, te lamp technique, uh -huh. which is how, if this is a, if this is a process that is uh, performed at the same temperature, uh, how uh, the, the naturation of the DNA uh, happens and how the primers uh, are aligned in the target? I, I'm going to reveal my, um, my skin, skin deep biochemistry knowledge at, at, at this point. Um, I know that it, it uses uh, strand displacement enzymes uh, and polymerases that, that perform the isothermal copying. Um, and the, the six primers involved land in different sequences and are, are designed in such a way to, to create barbell structures. And uh, so it's the, the amplicons are, 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 are more complex than what, what is made with PCR. Um, and it's, I think it's, it, it's nothing short of, uh, of biochemistry wizardry. Um, it's, uh, so, um, I, I wish I could, uh, you know, share more of the, the, the technical, uh, knowledge, but, um, the, you know, what, what others have shared with me is that the tools for developing the lamp primers have improved and the, just the maturation of of the uh, of the, the the mix composition has, I think, improved and stabilized, and uh, and that's caused the performance and reliability of of the core lamp reaction to to improve. Um, the first fully at home test approved in the United States is a colorimetric lamp test that uses a electronic uh, circuit board to measure the the um, the color change in the solution. And so there are more than, uh, there are more than 10 FDA EUAs approved now for, for LAMP. Uh, so it's, it's really, uh, I think, grown and, and come into its own during, during COVID. And I think going to be an increasing part of, of the, the molecular diagnostics testing space. Okay, okay, Randy. Carlos Eugenio Delgado wants to ask something. Sure. Thank you, Profe. Um, hello, Randy. Thanks so much for our, your uh, experience here. I have just a couple questions. So I saw the performance of the test was evaluated with 80 samples. Um, do you have any other evaluation experience of this test? That's the first question. And the second one is maybe it's for the professor or, or maybe to you, Randy, is can you tell us a brief of how will be the validation in Colombia? Uh, yes. Um, so the, the 80 samples that were run were 40 positives and 40 negatives of banked uh, clinical samples from the Stanford lab. Um, we have also run some clinical samples that we purchased. Those, uh, un unfortunately, that was a very difficult process. Those samples came in various states of quality and in, I think even in some different, different matrices, I'm not convinced that all of them were, were saline. Some may have been BTM or UTM. So we got sporadic results, um, with, with some of those samples, um, uh, and, but primarily, uh, we've, we do our development with inactivated virus, and we use uh, two types. We use one that we get from uh, what's called BEI. It's, a, it's sort of like a repository that I think is a branch of, the, of our NIH. So we get, essentially, they provide uh, this inactivated virus, which is, I think, the virus grown in monkey cells and then sonicated. So it's a complex cell lysate, but it's they provide two times 10 to the ninth virions in 500 microliters. So it's a lot of material. And we aliquot that into five microliter aliquots and store it at minus 80. And then we use those at, 
and dilute them down further and then spike them into uh, raw negative samples and then carry them through the entire process to make contrived uh, positive samples. The second type of inactivated virus we use is a commercial product from a company called Zeptometrics. And they, what, what I understand about those inactivated uh, particles or vi virions is that they're cross-linked and purified. And so, but those come refrigerated. So they are far more easy to use, but they're very expensive. Um, so we've done most of our work with the, the gamma BEI, but we, we, we do do some work with these other virions uh, as spike ins. Um, so, and in terms of the validation, what we would uh, provide is all of the components as we've configured them for our FDA test. And what, what we do is we pre-mix the primers with the other components of the master mix at, so, so that it makes running the test as easy as possible. And so the way we have it configured and how we're running it here is where you add the master mix to a pre-aliquoted amount of, of primers for a certain number of reactions. The primary, the easiest one that to, to use is a, is a half plate, 48 reactions so that you can do all of that in a 1.5 mil tube. And what I should, what I want to emphasize here is that, uh, you know, we, what we've done in, in terms of configuring this test is, is trying to make it as easy as possible and to reduce the chance for error and importantly to reduce chances for contamination so that the test can be run more reliably by less trained technicians in in lower resource, less experienced laboratories. And so that's a combination of how, how we configure the components of the test and then the training materials and protocols for the test. And so we're continuing to work on that. This is our first, first time packing up our lab and coming to do testing ourselves in another place. And next week, we're, we're sending some of this equipment and some of these reagents to a summer camp where a medical director is going to be testing kids. So it's first time somebody's going to be running this test uh, outside of our hands. And so we're we can transfer these learnings and also share these learnings in terms of really how to configure a testing program to run at medium or high throughput in in a in a uh, you know a lower resource more uh, a more lower cost lab. I think I should probably, I know we don't have too much time. I think since I'm here in this room where we've set up a lab, it might be good to show you uh, what this looks like in practice. I'll have to unplug my computer and kind of walk around a little bit. Um, but we, uh, here is the inactivation table and you see a water bath there and an electric dispenser. We also have a, a, a simpler non-electric bottle top dispenser. And that's what we use to quickly dispense one mil of the inactivation solution into the sample tubes. And I can show you a, a sample tube over here. These are the, the six we run this morning. Uh, again, we're not screening as many people as we would like to be screening at this, this conference because the prevalence has come down uh, so low. Um, but this, this process of inactivation takes about 15 minutes. We have racks where we drop 48 samples into the water bath for the eight minute incubation at once. So you can do the heat treatment on 48 at once. And then over here, and this, so this might be the kind of setup that you would have at, at the Reginales. Um, you have a, a simple table that you keep clean and you have a heat block for the, for the uh, uh, incubation. This is actually a new heater that arrived with two PCR blocks. Um, so you can run two plates at once. And so uh, since the reaction takes about, it takes 25 minutes, that, that one heater with two heat blocks can do four plates per hour. Uh, and we pool, doing, doing pools up to four, that can be over a thousand people per hour from, from that, that simple setup. And so we are actually mixing up the master mix each time and then plating it into, into strip tubes. We brought plates to be, to, to be running, but we aren't getting enough samples to run full plates. But what, what we've configured uh, and, and would want to design for Columbia is, and suggest for, 
for y'all is the preparation of plates, master mix plates that would be stored frozen, sealed with foil, so that once you inactivate the samples, you just do one two microliter pipette from the sample tubes through the foil into the full reaction mix in a quick mix. And then you can fill a plate even manually in about 20 minutes. And so this, this process can be, even without any, any automatic liquid handlers can be very, very fast. Okay. Okay, Randy. Then uh, to finish, um, we have two more questions. The one is, are these essays uh, just for one target or you are using more than one target and which are them? Oh, I greatly apologize. Uh, that should be included as a part of the, um, of the presentation. We, we are targeting three, uh, three genes, uh, ORF1AB, uh, N2, and E1. So the, the primer mix is 18 primers. And what we've done in the production run of our primers is we have the, the manufacturer pre-mix each of the genes. So to make the, the full primer mix, we resuspend each set in one milliliter. Then we combine those three tubes into, a, a, another, into another tube. Then we mix that with the other components of the mass of the reaction mix besides the colorimetric lamp master mix. So then that makes the other half of the, of the reaction mix. So we have, uh, we, we actually have in our laboratory now in California, 600,000 reactions worth of the, the primers, uh, all, all done at production, high quality scale, dried down on a, on a per gene set basis. So they're, it's, it's very straightforward uh, to, to make the mixes. And, and in addition, uh, with, the, with the kits we will receive in Colombia, we will also check the, the lamp primers from the Protocolo Colombia, which are targeting the, the gene S. And let's see the, the performance as well. And the other question is, uh, for the first step of the lamp, have you ever checked uh, to heat the samples at 90, 95 uh, grades? Uh, we, we do heat the sample at 95 degrees C for eight minutes. Um, so that's a part of the inactivation. It's the, the chemical TSEP EDTA plus the, the eight minute heat step. We have tried just the heat only uh, and seen worse performance, uh, both in PCR and LAMP. So um, we, the combination of the TSEP plus the heat works, works the best in our hands. Perfect. Randy, I think there are no more questions. Uh, we can then finish our activity today here. And thank you so much for your, for your, your nice talk. And now we leave you to continue with your, your event in Miami. Okay. Great. Great. And if there are follow-up questions, uh, Gustavo, please, please let me know or put me in touch okay. with, with folks. I'm I happy, will to, uh, happy to follow up. Okay, perfect. And no thank problem. you so much for arranging this and mucho uh, gusto uh, to, to, to everyone. Um, and uh, our, you know, we, even, even though we've turned a corner uh, in the United States, we're, there are many of us in the space who are continuing to work very diligently and hard to help, help the rest of the world. And so um, thank you for this collaboration and for, uh, for the opportunity to, to uh, continue this important work. Okay, thank you, Randy. And thank you everybody for attending this uh, meeting today and uh, see you in the next activity we'll, we will have in, at the University of Antioquia. Bye-bye.